Okay, welcome everybody to the Overseas Development Institute. I'm Kevin Watkins, I'm director here. Before I pass on to Lindsay Hilsom, who I, th I think almost all of you will know, not least because of the role that she plays in bringing many of the issues that are under discussion here today to the attention of a far wider public. I just wanted to say a few words to introduce the event and the report. We're, we're here to discuss this. And I, I have to say, um, obviously, I'm biased. But I think this is an absolutely extraordinary report, which I'm, I'm really proud of as director of ODI to, to be here with you to present it. Um, and before we start, I just want to say a huge thank you to the team that are involved in producing what I think is an extraordinary um, and really timely and, and important piece of research. The, the, the backdrop to this event, we're here to discuss a report, but the backdrop to this event is that we're living in a world where I think there is more pressure on the humanitarian system than we've seen at any time since the Second World War. Not just the 60 million people who are displaced, but the hundreds of millions of people who are affected by conflict and natural disasters in country. Uh, last year, we saw governments around the world sign up for a very ambitious set of 2030 development goals for the eradication of poverty and health and education and other areas. I think the one thing we can say as a matter of absolute certainty uh, is that unless we can fix the humanitarian system so that it's able to respond to the needs of people who have been displaced by violence or natural disasters, uh, and to support them in rebuilding their lives. The, the goals that have been set will be a pipe dream. Um, the central argument of this report, I think, can be summarized in two broad propositions. That, first of all, that there's, an ex there's an amazing amount of very good work that happens through the humanitarian system with extremely dedicated people at the helm. But there is a gap between what the system is capable of achieving and what it actually achieves. And that gap actually can be measured in human suffering and the deficits that, um, that I was describing. The report traces the gap in part, I think, to what economists would call um, efficiency losses and transaction costs. And in particular, a tendency to over-rely on an established system and to fail to draw on the potential of local partners, of new entrants to the market for innovation and effective delivery. So we're here to discuss, I think, you know, what is one of the great issues of our day. We have a report that, that sets out a compelling analysis of the problem. Uh, I think and hope in many areas it's going to be pretty controversial. So I'm certainly looking forward to sitting here and uh, listening to the debate kicked off by you guys. So, Lindsay, I'll, I'll pass over to you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kevin. And thank you, all of you, for, for coming to take part in this debate today. My name is Lindsay Hilsom. I'm a journalist. I work for Channel 4 News. Um, in the dim and distant past, when my hair was long and brown as opposed to short and gray, I was an aid worker. And, um, well, a lot's changed since then, but I think that what this report is saying is not quite enough. And that's uh, what we're going to discuss today. Um, can you put your phones on silent? But you are supposed to be tweeting avidly <laughs> because everybody now has the skill of being able to listen and concentrate and tweet at the same time. And the hashtag is RemakeAid. So the humanitarian system today is, as Kevin said, at a critical juncture. 125 million people in need around the world, Syria, Sudan, Somalia. I think the people here don't need that introduction. But there is an issue which is that a lot of those people, beneficiaries, don't see that this system is really benefiting them. And things have changed. I mean, the, the nature of warfare has changed. Drones, remote weapons, it's not all the same as it, as it was. And the traditional Western-dominated humanitarian aid system is changing whether we, whether you, like it or not. I mean, when I go out now, I see a lot of aid from Saudi Arabia, from Malaysia, all sorts of, of different places. And the question is whether the system, as it's 
exists is really keeping up with those changes. Now, this report, it lays out a proposal for fundamental change to reorient the humanitarian se uh, sector towards a new system to adapt to the reality today and the reality tomorrow. But I, I've just returned from the real world, from Syria. Mm. And what I hope that we can also do today is to look at this report, which I hope that many of you will have read, and see how it can work in the real world. I've just re returned from somewhere where last week, four out of five aid convoys were blocked by the government, and the fifth aid convoy to a besieged area was blocked by the rebels, where on Sunday, the World Food Program flew over Deir Ezzor, which is a government-held area besieged by Islamic State, and dropped food from 16 and a half thousand feet right, in a, a whole new technique. And they have to do that, partly because there is need there, but also because if they don't do that, there's no way the government is going to let them aid into the areas which they or their allies from Hezbollah and so on are besieging. So that is the reality on the ground, which we, I think, have to address as well as the, the issues which are laid out here about you know, letting go of power and control, Western aid is letting go of power and, of power and control, and, uh, you know, and other things which, which have stayed within, within the system that we have. So let me explain briefly how we're going to do this. First of all, Christina Bennett is going to give us a summary of the report, and then we're going to have video questions from people around the world, from Afghanistan, South Sudan, Myanmar, etc., which is good, so it isn't just a bunch of Wazungu in London talking to each other. Um, and then there'll be a bit of time for, for Q&A. And I'm supposed to thank the people who've helped us with the videos, which is, which is great, because I think a very important part of this process, especially the Jafra Foundation in Syria, who sent us a video from Yarmouk, um, you know, it's a Palestinian refugee camp inside Damascus over the weekend. Now, I'm then going to introduce the panel, one of whom is supposed to be on a video link, but I see no sign of him. No. Oh, there he is. Stephen O'Brien. Stephen is the head of OCHA, the UN, uh, he's the United Nations Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, he used to be an MP. He was Parliamentary Undersecretary of State <coughs> in, uh, in uh, DFID and was the Prime Minister's Special Envoy to Sahel. Stephen, can you hear us? Uh, good morning uh, to you. It's, uh, uh, I think, good afternoon, uh, your time, but certainly. Uh, uh, early here, and I'm very, very glad to be joining you. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Penny Lawrence, on my right, is the Deputy Chief Executive of Oxfam. Yves Dacour, uh, Director General of the ICRC, International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, Sarah Pantuliano, who is here at, what's your job at? Oh, your Director of Humanitarian <laughs> Programs at ODI. I just knew she was important. <laughs> and. Um, Mark Lowcock, who is the Permanent Secretary in the uh, British uh, DFID Department of International Development. So, before we go further, Christina, can you give us an introduction to the report? Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, panelists, for being here. Thanks all of you for joining us in this event, both here in the room and online, um, to discuss this report and then some of the larger issues. Um, HPG's flagship report, Time to Let Go, is based on the premise that human the humanitarian system is suffering from a crisis of legitimacy, that despite decades of reform, the sector is still falling short in the world's most enduring crises, and despite a commitment to accountability to affected populations, it is not doing a good job in the eyes of the people it aims to serve. According to research from Ground Truth, only one in six people surveyed during the initial response after the Nepal earthquake, and one in 16 during the Ebola response in West Africa, felt that their most important needs were being met. You will hear in a few minutes from these videos that we've put together, questions posed directly from people now living in crisis about why a system with so many resources at its disposal is unable to meet their needs. This report is also based on the fact that these attempts at change have focused on the system as it exists today, rather than tackling more fundamental problems of power dynamics, incentives, and architecture, and engaging with the politics of the international system itself. And despite all of the discussions about the need for change in the lead up to the World Humanitarian Summit, tackling internal problems has been deemed a non-starter. So what's changed? Lindsay alluded to this a little bit before. The conduct of war and the nature of disasters looked very different, looks very different today than it did in 1945, 
when the humanitarian sector came of age, or indeed in the 1990s when the system that exi exists today took shape. Disasters are more intense, they're more costly. Conflicts are overwhelmingly internal, not international, fought with new technologies and fought um, among non-state actors. Urban violence is on the rise. Large-scale and long-term displacement is one of the lar largest global challenges of our time. Crises last longer, and distinctions between emergency relief and long-term development are no longer that relevant. I won't go into detail on all of this now. I'm sure you're all aware of these trends, and there's more detail on the analysis in the report itself. But perhaps just as importantly, there are massive changes in who is funding, organizing, and delivering humanitarian aid which is significantly shifting the, the relationship between aid giver and aid recipient and should be changing the way that we work. But in fact, it isn't. States have become more assertive responsor, responders. Regional organizations have established humanitarian departments. Local organizations and businesses are providing substantial amounts of aid and even in those sensitive conflict environments like in, in Syria and in Yemen, they've had a little bit more success delivering assistance than their international counterparts. Remittances are more significant, consistent, and reliable than international aid or foreign direct investment. The rise of donors like China, like Turkey, like the Gulf states is less about them being new. It's more about our awareness of their importance. But despite this awareness, we're, we perpetuate an exclusivity that prevents the sector from making the best use of these capacities and these resources. So what, is, what are the barriers to change? What's preventing change? Well, for one, Money and power concentrated at the center in an oligopoly of a limited number of donors and a limited number of recipients that drive a preoccupation with growth and market share and create powerful disincentives for handing over responsibility for other organizations that could serve as competition for funding. And while there's much talk about accountability to affected populations, there is an enduring cultural paternalism that views indigenous solutions to be as inferior as interna to international ones. As a result, most engagement with local NGOs is in the form of subcontracting arrangements, and the cultural, procedural, and linguistic barriers to more constructive engagement are high. In places like Syria, for example, donors lost valuable time in the search for partners that met their strict criteria, instead of adapting to the context and being more flexible in their choices. There's also a tendency to believe that a homogenous humanitarian sector is a better one, that those operating outside of the, tradi the traditional system are keen to subscribe to our existing structures and processes. On their part, these rising humanitarian donors and international organization and aid organizations are not at all interested in supplementing the traditional aid system. In fact, they're developing their own approaches. They challenge the universality of humanitarian principles and coordination structures as vehicles for unwelcome Western bias and intervention. They opt for homegrown structures and funding streams that they feel are more legitimate. This was the case during the Ebola outbreak and is still the case in places like Syria and in Yemen. This is not to say that we should all assume that local response is always a better one. There simply needs to be a more honest assessment about the strengths and limitations of different types of responders and a more explicit recognition of the complexities such engagement involves. Even inside the sector, the humanitarian principles have become a barrier to change. Dividing humanitarians between those who adhere to neutral, impartial, and independent aid and those who accept a wider interpretation of their life-saving remit that includes addressing the causes of crises as well as their effects. While some would say such distinctions are necessary to limit political influence and to, sure, to ensure that aid reaches the neediest, others point to the role that such distinctions play in preventing more comprehensive and more sustained response in the majority of the world's crises, which often last for years and even decades. In short, to remain effective, to remain relevant, the humanitarian sector must regain its legitimacy for itself, vis-a-vis -vis these new and emerging actors, and in the eyes of affected people. To do this, it must abandon the structures, the behaviors, and the culture that is currently holding it back. Remaking humanitarian action requires letting go in three key ways. First, it means letting go of power and control and shifting the humanitarian system's focus from one of supply to one of support. This involves a commitment by the system's main players to make difficult changes in the way that they operate. 
As a start, UN agencies and large international NGOs should shift their priorities away from direct implementation to become enablers of others in crisis response through investment in their capacity and through direct financing of their operations. Donors need to support them in this shift. Second, this means letting go of unhelpful incent incentives by casting off the assumptions, the power dynamics that work against evolution and change. The system must redefine success so that the needs of, a, of people trump the drive for greater resources and organizational visibility and collective crises outcomes become as important as individual achievement. Third, this involves letting go of the unhelpful divisions that set humanitarian action apart from other forms of aid and recognizing that relief can in fact come in many forms. As crises last longer and straddle conflicts, disasters, and endemic poverty, humanitarian responses have to be more realistic, more honest, and more ethical in responding to people's needs. Realistic in the sense that humanitarians need to dial back their own expectations of what humanitarian activities and funds are able to do and work more closely with development organizations when longer term approaches are needed. They must be more honest in their use of the humanitarian label, applying it to a more classical form of action undertaken by specialized organizations that are able to uphold independent and neutral conduct. And it, they must be ethical in the sense that humanitarian organizations need to let go of the idea that only card-carrying humanitarians can provide effective relief. They must accept that different forms of assistance are equally legitimate and can coexist. Enabling capable responders, whether international, governmental, or local, to more, work more cohesively. Effectively addressing people's needs, not ideology, not exceptionalism, and not self-interest, should dictate approaches to crisis response. And internal system reform, whether of mandate or of mindset, must be where these changes start. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Thank you very much, uh, Christina. And there's a lot of nutty, nutty and knotty issues in there, I think. Um, now, we're going to have the first video. We've got two videos um, for the first question. So what's going to happen is we're going to play the videos, and then I'm going to direct um, the questions, which the videos are to selected people. So let us start off with a video from a woman who is in Yarmouk, the Palestinian besieged Palestinian camp in Damascus in Syria. Right. Oh, it's going to happen. I hate technology. <laughs> يعني في عنا نقص نقص كبير وبالبنية التحتية عنا نقص بالماء عنا نقص بالكهرباء عنا نقص بكل شيء وكل هذا بتطلب إنه حدا يشتغل من شانه حدا يتعب من شانه إحنا ما في حدا عم بيشتغل من شان مخيم ما حدا عم بيتعب من شان مخيم هالكرتونة يعني إحنا بغنا عن هالكرتونة يفتحونا هالطريق وزبطونا أمورنا وإحنا بغنا عن هالكرتونة يعني هالكرتونة لا ما عم بتصير شيء الدم اللي إحنا بحاجة إله. an unhappy lady in the camp in Yarmouk who feels that the aid being provided has bears very little relationship to the need. Um, let's hear from Lina Ahmadi. She's in Afghanistan. I'm not sure where in Afghanistan. <laughs> So what we have there is complete discontent from people who are supposed to be beneficiaries. So um, I'm going to put this one to, to you first, um, Eve. Um, is that just grumbling? Or is there, a, is there a serious point there? I think there is a serious point. Uh, and I think this is the reality we're confronted with every day. I think we see people not happy. Uh, people feeling sometimes completely abandoned by, by some of us. I think that, that's a reality. When I'm hearing the lady of Yarmouk, the reality of Yarmouk is exactly what she describes. It's not just about UNRWA, it's about all of us. I think that's, that makes a lot of sense. But there is a huge but, and I'm, I didn't hear that in the report so far. 
A, we have to be humble. You mentioned humility. Your colleagues also mentioned mm. humility. I think first and foremost, let's recognize in which environment we are. Right? We're in an environment where today there is absolutely no convergence between states to deal with the issue. Yarmouk question could have been dealt without any problem if state would have agreed to let us access. Mm. No problem. Let's also be honest. Syria could have been dealt without any problems if the Security Council would have done its job. I'm sorry about that. Let's start with where we are. As humanitarian, I'm not saying let's blame the other, but let's also be humble of what we can do. So far, there is just no international convergence when it comes to deal with global issue and to deal with conflict. That's one. Be where she's totally right. It's about trying hard. We need to try hard. And here there is a question we need to ask ourselves. It's about how are we ready? What type of risk are we ready? How far do we want to push? For me, the critical question is, how far are we ready to take the risk we're taking in order to get access? And here, I think the close proximity to people affected. I think what she's calling, and I think I like also what the lady of Af Afghanistan is talking mm -hmm. about. What she's talking about, where does this go money go? Mm -hmm. If she doesn't see us, if she doesn't engage with us, that's a real good question. And she cannot engage only with subcontracting partner. The real issue is she needs to engage with us. And we need to be on the front. We need to be with the people. We being? We, uh, and my organization, for example, I think it's an important question. It's about risk taking. I think as an organization, you cannot just outsource the risk to your local partner. You as an organization, you need to be able to take the risk, including with your own people. In my organization, it means having international staff and national staff on the front line. Which, with of course, the people. you have, and I but think it's we critical. have to acknowledge that some of those have been killed, particularly yeah. in Syria. So but but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not looking for oh, poor or few. No, I know, but I'm just, I'm just making that I'm just looking point. at what, yeah. what are the questions. And here there is a question to Stephen, for example. What does that mean in terms of you know, security management? How do we, and if we're serious about you know, engaging, most likely UN, for example, have to look at security management and also some of the international NGOs okay, will have to look at how it works. Okay, we'll follow. Stephen, I'm going to come to you, but I'm actually going to come, come to you. I'm not sure if, because it was subtitled, so I'm not sure if you um, were able to, to see here what the uh, questions were. It, basically, the beneficiaries both in uh, Syria and Afghanistan were saying, well, you know, what the hell is this aid? We see nothing. Um, is that just a question of perception? And also, can I bring you back to something which you said a few months ago? You said the international aid system is not broken. Um, do you still think that? Or are you now beginning to think that maybe it is, and a report like this is actually really important at identifying where it's broken and where it needs mending? Uh, well, thank you very much. And uh, I think the first thing to say is how important it is to recognize that if we're going to be genuine, about really putting aid in the hands of the people who need it and need it most. You know, a lot does have to change. There's no question about that. And I think the commitment to change is, above all, what I very much welcome about uh, this report. And indeed, uh, if I may uh, add that the Secretary General's report, uh, One Humanity Shared Responsibility, which was published in advance of the upcoming World Humanitarian Summit, also identifies very fundamental change that is required, not least to try to uh, ensure that uh, all of us engage in humanitarian action. And uh, by that, I, I do broaden it out way beyond uh, the so-called system. Uh, all have to try to get it into uh, the hands and meeting the needs of, of local people. But when you asked me, um, uh, going back to a, a quote that was attributed to me about uh, the, uh, the system is not uh, broken, it's broke. Uh, that was in a particular uh, context when people were challenging us on the resources. And, of course, from that point of view, uh, I think we all know that the gap between what uh, resources are made available and what we need in order to be able to deliver at the scale of the humanitarian needs is, in fact, why uh, that uh, is an important phrase from the point of view of at least the resources. But I'm, I'm not uh, here to defend a system. Um, I recognise, particularly after all the, um, the months that I've now been uh, doing this job, that there are huge areas which do need to change. Uh, of course, the challenge is how to get about that and to make it in everybody's common interests to embrace change uh, rather than defend uh, what could be described as some of the uh, vested interests. And that, I, I do accept, is a very tough challenge. I pick up on Eve's point, for instance, on the question of the UN making its security assessments. We have a responsibility as does every organization to uh, make sure that we give the best possible safety uh, to our own people and to the people who work on our behalf, whether in agencies or indeed local 
uh, people. And so we have to have the various assessments. But um, whether, take Yemen, uh, Eve's organization, uh, the people I'm responsible for, and um, one or two others are actually in Yemen providing extraordinary and very difficult circumstances, amazing aid, but nowhere near enough and not necessarily uh, at the scale of universality that's required. There are a lot who are not there who we'd love to encourage there, but there are very genuine, very genuine issues about uh, the security. So he's right to raise the point, and the question is how much risk is there, given that it is not, as we can see in Syria, it is certainly not anything that anybody wants to do, is to send people uh, into risky environments when they're trying to do their very best to help people. Uh, look at the checkpoints into Madaya. You have eight uh, where you have to get to the agreement of the Syrian government, then the next two are Hezbollah, and the next uh, five are uh, the local militia. And you have to have those negotiations, and no Security Council resolution, no international discussions in Geneva, and no, uh, no member states of the UN are ever going to solve what are the very, very important negotiations to make sure the sniper doesn't lift his gun as the truck comes through. That's the practical reality on the ground, and that's what Eve's organization and those I'm responsible for we have to work with. So getting the aid through uh, does require us to have that security issue. But no, I'm in no doubt. Let me, let me, do uh, Stephen, let me stop you there and put that to, to Sarah, because you've just talked about the, the reality on the ground. Uh, so, Sarah, let me put to you, I mean, you are now an academic. I mean, it's all very lovely, this report. But what about the five checkpoints and the three checkpoints and the two checkpoints and the sniper? You know, th this has been the reality of humanitarian aid always. It's not, uh, it's not a reality of the conflict today. These challenges have always been there. And these challenges that you need to manage and, you know, understand that you to, to engage around that. But the dissatisfaction is not just, you know, in, in the context of Yarmouk or some of the highest, you know, the highest volatile areas in which we work. It's everywhere. It's in the protracted crisis, in the crisis that are linked to drought response, in, you know, the natural hazard related crisis, you know, the, the, the um, ground okay, truth so service. Okay, so beneficiaries are unhappy. They are unhappy. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. So what, what is our role then? You know, what's, what's the point? What's the point if we are not able to change the way we work to make sure that they really what can would, steer? What, is, what, what do you think, from the research you've done, would change that? So, so far, the vast majority of organizations would just go into a crisis thinking, what can I give? What is my mandate? What can I supply? What kind of things my organization mm -hmm. is set up to do? And we pay quite a lot of lip service to listening to what people want and aspire to, but actually the response is, that's what I can do and that's what I'm going to give to you because, you know, that's either my mandate or that's what the priority of my donor is. Mm -hmm. And no matter how much lip service or, you know, if you want efforts, we, we try them in the sector, you know, mm, there's a lot of r rhetoric around accountability to beneficiaries, but I think, you know, but the reality is that, P that aid organisations are also accountable to to donors. Yeah, and, and, so and it's maybe a very we need to rebalance, you yeah. know, where the accountability lies. Okay, I mean, let's, I'm going to hold that there because uh, let, I want to get on to the next video. So let's hold that thought. The next video is from Noor Hussain, who's a Rohingya refugee from Myanmar who has now got to Indonesia.
Okay, so again, Stephen, I'm not sure if you could hear what he was saying, but basically this man from Myanmar was rescued by fishermen, um, and now he's safe, but his family is back in Myanmar and suffering. And he, it was really interesting issues. One is the idea of living in dignity. And actually, just to digress slightly, I mean, having spent a lot of time in the Arab world and the Muslim world, oh, my God, this is, this is such a major thing that people talk about dignity and justice as opposed mm -hmm. to poverty. It's such a big issue that I think that we and aid agencies, I would say, just don't mm -hmm. get it. We're always talking about poverty. Mm -hmm. And they, they always talk about dignity and justice. It's not that complicated, but we don't get it. Um, that was my digression. Um, so our aid program's doing enough to ensure that those in need live in dignity and with respect, not just surviving. And also, he was rescued by Achenese fishermen, <coughs> not by any government, not by aid agencies. So what does that tell us about responding to need? Penny. Mm. So I, the situation of the Rohingya is the most appalling situation. But again, like the Syria situation, we need political solutions for what are described as humanitarian problems not humanitarian solutions for political problems. Uh, again, so fundamentally, I think that is a, a very similar uh, issue, Lindsay. In terms of, in terms of the Achenese fishermen rescuing uh, the guy, then this is very typical, and we need to get our heads around it. The first responders everywhere, whatever the humanitarian crisis, are your family, your community, and not the system. It is a diverse ecosystem. Maybe that's all right. And I think that is absolutely right. But if we pretend it's not the case and we regard the system as all of the system, then that is where the problem is. And that's why I think this report is very good in pointing out that we need to understand not just that it is a diverse ecosystem, but then how do we actually engage with that diverse ecosystem? How do we change our mindset? Because that does require us to change our mindset in order to respond to it. And where I think the report needs to go next is to say, well, if we agree on that rhetoric, which we mm. potentially are, then what the hell is stopping us from doing it? And that requires us to look quite deeply into ourselves and say, yeah, what's what's blocking us, uh, actually? Can if I, you wanted I, to come in on that. No, just, just a bit on that, because if, if we agree with that, which is, in fact, it's clear today that not only in Myanmar or, or, or in Syria, but in Somalia or whatever, we as a formal sectors provide only part of the aid. Mm. We know it. In conflict and natural disaster. Yeah. If we agree with that, two critical questions. A, the concept we are using are wrong. The idea that you have a system is so mechanical, and then you have people who are talking about fixing a system. It's not about a garage here, right? Mm. It's about people, it's about dynamics. So the question is, how do you empower? How are you collaborating, mm. right? How are you incentivizing? And also, what I find interesting is complementary and diversity. What we're dealing is not only with needs of the people, but it's also with constraint. That's the reality. The reality is, so the diversity is the interesting element. You talk about community. That's mm -hmm. great. And local community are central. But to be honest with you, in Myanmar, there are places where I would like not local communities to make all the choices. Frankly, if I'm of the other community, mm -hmm. I frankly don't want that neither. Absolutely. So as always, the situation is not just a perfect one. Now we just move and everything is local. It's perfect. No, let's be honest. So the point is, how do we build the complementary? Mm -hmm. How we bring the collaboration? Mm -hmm. And let's get read. And here, I'm missing that in the report. You still mm -hmm. talk about the system. That mm -hmm. is completely misleading. Mm -hmm. It's not a system. The reality today, and find another word, it's ecosystem, is something which is dynamic. Yeah. And if we agree with that, mm -hmm. then what we will praise is the fact it's different. It's diversity. And this is what will help us to manage the complexity of the situation, mm -hmm. managing the needs, and at the same mm -hmm. time, I would say the constraint. That's starting to be interesting. Sarah, I want you to come in on that. Yeah. And then Mark. Yeah. We talk about the system, but we challenge the system precisely because the system sees itself at the center. That, that's where the resources go. That's where the money goes. That's where you know the decision making around standards or you know procedures are made. When we fail to appreciate everything that is around the system, we talk about you know e everything that is changed around the system at length in the report and signal precisely to the system that they are progressively becoming irrelevant because the reality of aid around it is changing. The reality of response on the ground is changed. Has changed. And so it's a, you know it's it's a call to the system to finally wake up and really open up. Um, not as a system, but in terms of bringing its expertise. I mean, when you call a system, 
the system by def default will never respond to this call, right? So I think we have to agree that but in concept you, well, there is a you move. There is, a, there is a system. But I think that the, the point is that, you know, all the other things that go along in it, I mean, you know, this was point, Alex de Waal wrote about this in Sudan 20 years ago, that actually when you analyze um, what people relied on in the war in Sudan in the 1980s, it was much more neighbors and informal Absolutely. structures and so Absolutely. on than it ever was international aid. And yet we all know that um, international aid has this sort of massive role in South Sudan, which none of Thank us you. quite quite understand. I want, Mark, you wanted to come well, in. Well, I, 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 firstly, I think we need to acknowledge that, by the way, thanks for convening us and the debate and uh, the report and so but we do need to acknowledge that in any great big um, tens of billions of dollars a year expenditure thing, there's a whole set of vested interests. Yep. We need to be honest about that. Now, on this, um, this system thing, I mean, actually, I think there is a distinction between the um, conflict-related emergencies and the natural disasters. Okay. Actually, the natural disasters, the sudden onset things, uh, those kind of problems are less acute. And, and in fact, national response and local response tends to be much more effective, and we, all, we can all get behind it. I do, I do disagree with one thing that Sarah said earlier, which is I don't think the current set of issues that we've got in the conflict space are the ones we've always had. I think that August 2003, when terrorists bombed the UN in Baghdad, mm -hmm. completely changed the environment in which we work. You know, before that, aid workers were not gone after. Every now and then, one of Eve's colleagues would be kind of caught by some renegade in the African bush and march around the bush for a few weeks and need a new pair of shoes and then give them back. But something completely okay. different happened in well, August in, 2003. Sorry, without, without changing, in the 90s already, we had lost, for example, six colleagues killed in Chechnya, clearly, you yeah. know, people came but in the hospital, just the to mention it was... Yeah, no, that was the beginning of it, but I think that the, the, the point remains that the danger of, of kidnapping, like it's yeah. the same for journalists, it is much yeah. more serious and it's much more likely now than it used to be. Yeah, and so yeah. Um, it takes us back to the point Stephen was making and Penny was making, that if we want to engage effectively in this environment, we have to be doing <laughs> politics and security and conflict resolution yeah. as well as yeah. being in our own little cosy silo of, of the, the sort of virtuous folk delivering the, the aid supplies. But I mean, I think that that's, that, that's actually true. And for a government, as you represent, that's in a sense it's easier than for a humanitarian organization which is not involved in those other things. But let's listen to the next um, video and then carry on the discussion. So the next one is from uh, Soro Mike Hakim, he's in South Sudan, and he works for a national NGO. My name is Soro Mike Hakim, the Chief Executive Officer for SPEDEP. I came from South Sudan, based in Juba. Uh, when and how will the world leaders, the humanitarian summit, recognize the contribution made by the national NGOs in South Sudan? And uh, how the world leaders, uh, the humanitarian uh, leaders, make sure that the voices of the national NGOs in South Sudan are included? Now, I'm going to put that one actually first to, to Stephen, if I may, because, Stephen, the UN, UN OCHA, you work obviously through um, UN agencies and also through the international NGOs. But the point being made is that you know money just gets diluted, and you give it to Oxfam or whoever, and they give it to the local NGO, and then you know twenty percent, twenty percent, twenty percent goes. And actually, the local NGOs are the ones who know what's what's going on, and it could be a lot more efficient if if that was just done directly. I'm in absolutely no doubt that the more we can get to uh, the delivery uh, through local NGOs, the better. Huge amounts is happening in Syria today by that very method. In fact, it's the only way we can do it. Uh, I think that it's absolutely clear to me that um, we need to raise that proportion considerably. But that does mean that we have to uh, ensure that we nonetheless still have an ability to genuinely assess that we reach the intended target of meeting needs. And yes, it was referred to uh, briefly earlier on. I don't think it's a light matter that we also need to operate within humanitarian principles. This is not just some kind of Western construct imposed on others. This is a very fundamental uh, tenet of the values which drive all of us to make sure that we can reach people impartially, safe and unimpeded. Because if we don't do that, we don't have the right 
to call upon governments when today's conflicts mean that often governments are part of the problem. They're not doing the right things by their people and therefore we need to have access. And South Sudan is a very clear example where none of the political actors seem to be acting in a way which is helping their own people. Uh, and yes, we do have a failure of politics because we have that at the Security Council, we have that at local level, and then all of us, whether on the panel there in London or uh, me here, we're all working to try and fix the problems of broken politics, uh, which is how the humanitarian uh, needs um, ultimately arise from, from the complex situation. So, uh, as was, uh, I didn't quite get all the clip, but as I think was um, referred to, the World Humanitarian Summit, and I don't want to over, over, you know, overplay the fact, but it is something which can really represent a transformative opportunity to get the kind of change that this report, that this discussion, uh, is clearly wanting to prompt. Not because we want to throw everything out that we've done before. That would be wrong. An enormous amount of good work has always taken place, and we, we admire that. But it's because the nature, as Mark said, the nature of the context in which we operate have remark really remarkably changed. And so I think we need to be quite concrete about what we mean by trying to get to change, which is going to help people locally, help local NGOs feel much more included, much more used, much more um, able to take the decisions that are going to put people who are affected by crisis, particularly protracted crisis, which often conflicts are, uh, at the centre of our decision making. And that is, in the end, going to mean a, a bit of a brave and courageous approach by, yes, UN agencies, and we're all in very deep discussions at the moment about whether we can deliver the new way of working under the grand bargain that we want to offer at the World Humanitarian Summit about working towards collective outcomes, which means that we can but, then but move to see, multi year time frame. Let, let me come in with a supplementary question there to ask. I, I don't really know what you mean because what the report is talking about is a surrender of, of power to local NGOs, to, to different actors. Um, but I'm aware that there is a lot, of, and I'm going to come to Mark in on this, that there's a lot of um, pressure from donors, which is about corruption, about a, you know, aid going astray and so on. And you often end up sort of stuck in the middle of that. And so what, when you say you know, a change, what are, what are the concrete changes? Or let, give, me, give me two concrete changes which you are pushing to come out of that humanitarian summit. Well, for instance, I would want to see that there was a real and fundamental agreement absolutely supported by the donors, and let's be clear, the major donors, that there will be a collective needs assessment at local humanitarian country team level, which is when we bring in all the people, local NGOs, NGOs, as well as the UN agencies, and we make an assessment of the needs that we also include uh, good risk analysis as well, so we can help bring in the new forms of uh, support and partnership coming in from people like the World Bank and the local regional uh, banks, so we get a much more financed, multi-year approach uh, to breaking down the humanitarian development uh, nexus, which has been a bit of a bedevilment for us all, uh, and to make sure that through collective uh, uh, needs assessments, we end up with a view towards getting to collective outcomes. Uh, another, uh, another Sounds like a recipe for endless bureaucracy mm -hmm. and meetings to me. Well, you see, I think that's part of the problem, is there's a real sense that um, uh, every time you get a meeting together, and, and goodness knows, I'm hardly somebody sitting here who's not been uh, born into bureaucracy, uh, who has to work his way through the UN. The UN is necessarily going to have a bureaucracy. It is the ultimate expression of the will under the Charter of 193 member states who are trying to find some form of common agreement. The advantage we have of what has been set out in this report, in the SG's report, which I don't think anybody will suggest is not embracing and wanting to prompt change and give a license to change, a really fundamental change, is that this is trying to get us all to come together at the highest common factor, not the lowest common denominator. So yes, of course I take your barb about bureaucracy, but it isn't. This is about the practicality of a meeting in Juba where you have people sitting around the table when the needs arise and say, what are the collective analysis which is going to give us the needs, rather than everybody sits around the table and says, well, I can do this, I can do the other, Sarah rather mentioned this, and then they go out and they go off and go to the donors, and each of the agencies goes to fill up its bucket uh, to come back and then deliver what it wants to do, rather than having a coordinated approach, which, of course, I'm responsible to try to make happen, is 
to say, well, we need so much to be focused on food, so much on access, some on protection, and we need to start building back better where we can. So we start looking at the multi-year time frame. So you ask for concrete outcomes. That would be deeply concrete. But one of the things you have to do is you have to empower the local resident coordinator, humanitarian coordinator. Somebody has to actually set an agenda, chair that meeting, draw conclusions, chase and enforce the outcome. Is that concrete? Well, it depends. Yeah, I mean, it depends who it is, doesn't it? Because sometimes that person is a genius and sometimes he's a, he, and it is usually he is a useless jobs worth. And so it's a, years, you know, it, it's years, actually very, years, it's very four years, difficult four years so ago, to do all that. Lindsay, yes? Lindsay, Lindsay, you must allow me to reply to that because that's, uh, <laughs> four years ago, I think, uh, and this is all before my time, four years ago, I think that was a, probably a fair criticism that the gene pool of people who were appointed to those positions uh, was not deep uh, enough. <laughs> I think what has genuinely been, what has genuinely come through over the most recent times, I only have to point you to the enormous uh, bravery and skill yes. of what's going on in Syria, what's going oh, yeah. on no, in Yemen, what's those going on they're, 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 they're brilliant. No, except that. But I actually want to, to go to, to Mark at, at Diffid because we, we started this particular section by talking about, in, about local NGOs, but with Diffid, you're actually getting further and further away from them. You don't even give to international NGOs directly. You always go via, you know, accountancy firms, PwC, KPMG. And so it actually, the, the money, apart from that money being creamed off, it goes through somebody who has no idea about development. They're just an accountant. Before it gets to somebody, you give it to somebody, you give it to somebody, you give it to somebody. So, speaking as a proven accountant, yes, <laughs> uh, among other things, um, I, I wanted to. I do want to come back to. I was going to claim the prize on the panel for most time spent in point, pointless bureaucratic meetings, actually, but you sort of move us on. We, we uh, even ahead of even ahead of Stephen. Yes. Um, I want to come back. I, I want, just want to come back to Sora Mike Hakim's point because for us, the mantra the mantra on this is local and national where possible and international where necessary. And a lot, actually, of the recent programming and capacity building, things like the Humanitarian Academy we've created with Save the Children, and a lot of the, the sort of um, startup programming we have is, is in line with that mantra. But there is a caveat, and it's the same caveat that we heard from Lena Amadi on the streets of Kabul. Because just as people locally want to know where the money goes, yeah. the people paying the bills want to know where the money goes. Yes. And it is a big problem for the, coming back to the system, that we are so bad at telling the story of where the costs fall. And we need to invest more in this. I wrote to Stephen and Filippo Grandi and Earth and Cousin and um, Tony Lake about this in January to ask for collaboration in a, an exercise to throw a lot more light on where the costs fall and where the money falls out of the system between somebody like me writing a check in London and it mm -hmm. passing down through the system and somebody like Sora Mike Hakim getting to spend it on improving the lives and, and relieving the suffering mm -hmm. of someone actually right there. But please do answer the, the, I mean, the, the KPMG and so on question because it is a change that we have seen in DFID mm. um, and it seems to me that it's a change that's going in the opposite direction from the change which this report is talking about. Oh, well, I, I'm not dissenting from the difference between us and the report. I think, you know, I, there are lots of things in the report that I like, but I think there's a, there's a little bit of need to recognize that whoever is paying the bills is going to have a point of view about what's happening to the money. Yeah. Yeah. Can okay. I come in? Yeah, sorry, <laughs> Penny. Example on this. So, yeah. <clears throat> so, Mark, you are, you know, I think DFID, you know, is really one of the, the best donors on mm -hmm. this, Lindsay. But for all of us, when we're operating at the higher levels of our organisation, this is the case for you, Mark, as it's the case for me, there's a difference between the rhetoric and the reality on the ground at the moment. So even if we all agree that this is what we need, we need local leadership. Um, uh, the, the START network, which GFID funds, is, is a great example. There's a, a financial enablers stream of this where we've tried to say, well, look, we know the Philippines is a willing and capable state. And, Stephen, I do think, you know, you can't lump all states together. There are different, uh, no. you know, very different strategies that are needed, aren't there, for very different states. So if you take Absolutely. the Philippines, yeah. there's a lot of capable local NGOs. And we were saying, right, this is an opportunity then, DFID, to put money in the hands of those local NGOs so that they can purchase services to build their capacity from whoever they choose, whether it's Oxfam or anyone else, 
let's put the power uh, there. And Mark, at, the, at the higher echelons, DFID agreed, but actually getting that agreement through the accountants, I'm afraid, Mark, was really tricky. So what we've got is one example of that out of this very ambitious program, mm. one example where we're allowed to do that. And we've got to prove that. It's, it's ring-fenced for a couple of years, and we'll watch it very closely. It is happening And then now. potentially we can roll it out. Now, that's a good example, mm. but my goodness, that's one example when actually, you know, how do we get... Uh, how do I allow that poor sod of a program officer who's working for Oxfam not to hear if a penny goes missing, you're in trouble, and actually you get the sack. But we also want you to build the capacity of local partners. Which would you go for? Yep. So it's the same within, uh, you know, it's, it's a real challenge so to leadership. Let's is. hear from, before I go to anybody else, um, let's go to Somalia, because there's a video from, who is it from? Khali Ali Khashi. He was in the Albiri IDP camp uh, settlement in Somalia. وحالوبهاي <laughs> I think this is a really important point. It's about long term and short term. And I mean, I see it all the time with uh, uh, with Syrian refugees. Uh, you know, the people fled thinking that they were going to be away from home for mm. six months, maybe nine months, and five years on, there they are. And so, what is happening? They're coming to Europe. Um, or they're sitting there with the possibility of thinking, my children have no future, they have no education, they have no nothing. And the international humanitarian system finding it extremely difficult to adjust to that issue. Stephen, I want, I want to come back to you on that. What do you think you can do to try and, and deal with that, the fact that what people would hope would be a short-term humanitarian catastrophe turns into a very long-term issue? And if it's not addressed, you know, that has all sorts of other consequences. Well, I think that uh, this is this is the nub of it, and uh, I, I'm glad we've got uh, that. I, I'm sorry that that video didn't come through, so I, I'm glad you've summarised it because I, I didn't catch that, which is a shame. But um, I think that the the essence here is that uh, if we look at really putting the people who are affected by crisis at the heart of our decision making, then the way we have to look at it, in my view, is we have to find a way in a universal in, a, in an objective and well-assessed uh, way, we have to find a way of investing behind their ability to survive and also to have hope. Uh, in the meantime, in conflicts, we also have a deep obligation to do our very best to protect civilians at the same time. Now, um, it was absolutely said by Penny that uh, everything is context-specific. Uh, every country, every context that we find is different. Uh, I think it was Mark who made the very important point that uh, there is a distinction between sudden onset natural disaster, whether uh, natural climate related or climate change increasingly related, um, where it's often very much more possible uh, to be, as it were, working in partnership and in support of local capacity to deliver and very much to try and make sure that that is uh, strengthened and that actually part of your approach is not only to meet immediate needs, but at the same time to build a bigger resilience going forward for the future. And that then can couple with our uh, much greater commitment to early warning and preparedness. But 80% of the 125 million people affected by crisis, all the money that is required <coughs> to get the, the cash, to, to get the programs delivered by local people, all is now out of man-made conflict and the failure of politics and the inability to resolve conflict over time. So the new normal, sadly, is protracted crisis. Uh, five years is nothing. The average time now for displacement is 17 years. The average uh, length of an appeal 
from conflict is seven years from the, even the, the system. So uh, I think the issue here, as I see it, is very much uh, to make sure that we are investing behind people. And I would like to just say, the World Humanitarian Summit, in many ways, is a way of scaling up. What we have learned is a tremendous um, approach that the London, Syria, and the region conference uh, gave us in February. This was a way not just of raising money for the people, people absolutely necessarily stuck in Syria, who are in terrible crisis uh, after all these years, but also for those who have fled and are in the neighboring countries, because the approach was strategically how to invest in what the people themselves affected by crisis want, i.e., if I am getting bombs showered upon my home, of course I pick up my children and I run. You and I would do the same. But equally, after three years, whether I've run or whether I have stayed, and it's still gone on, I've also, even if there's no bomb dropping on me, I have lost hope. So you still think about moving, because where's your future? Mm. And it's at that point, by investing in people in Syria, in the neighboring countries, that was the right strategic approach, because it also meant that of that 12 billion that was raised, that half is going to immediate needs, but half will go to a more medium to long range uh, needs about building back hope, building a future, because that's for the people. So the only remaining issue, which is particularly relevant to the report that we're considering today, is how much can we then make the design of that uh, come, as it were, organically from a local imperative, rather than, as it were, being the international arena uh, coming and landing, as it were, on that situation. Yeah, and okay. I think that is where there's a real opportunity with the World Humanitarian Summit to really build on the five core responsibilities and through the mechanisms of all the people turning up to actually have a, an ability pro to propel that ability to make the fundamental changes that we need to get that dynamic into our total response. Thank you. Eve of the ICRC, you wanted to come in on that. Yeah, because I'm a little bit tired with our discussion right now. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it's not an interesting one, but it's a, again about us and how we can do better. And we have to do better. I understand we can do multi-year. I mean, we can do much better. We can also integrate some development technique you might have made uh, very clear on that one. But that's not the new things. What is the new things, really? The new things is that people behave differently. What I hear constantly in my, in my organization is in Somalia, people today do not compare us only between what we do to this community, but they check and they look what we did in Philippines yesterday. They are saying well, the service to providers is not good enough. Do that differently. The pressure that we got from people has changed dramatically over the next five years. I can predict to you in the next five years, people will, be, will look at us as service provider first and foremost. They will shape, and by the way, they are shaping also the way we already respond, but they are also the one who decide or not if we get access. If you want to get access and you want to be somewhat protected by the people, better make sure that you're relevant to the people. And tomorrow, if we're not relevant, I can tell you the price to pay will be bigger. So we won't see only video people complaining, but we will feel it, and we feel it that in the field already. If we're serious about that, and if, and I totally agree with Stephen, if Stephen says, and this is what the World Human Summit will say, protracted conflict are the core of what we want to do, better get our act together. And better make sure that our legitimacy, and we accept that, is in fact based on the fact that people are looking at our service provider, that we are ready to engage with them directly, not only to understand their needs, but the coping mechanism, to see how it evolves, how it works, and last but not least, that we talk about reality. In Somalia, can we just one minute talk about that? The government, with all my respect, don't control a territory which is bigger than this room, right? And still, the international community wants to do everything through the government. OK, the reality is Somalia is controlled by other people. So as an aid organization, you need to be aware of that. You need to be aware of the reality of the people. You need to be able to engage Al-Shabaab very painfully. You don't engage them from London. You engage them directly on the spot. If we're serious about conflict, that will be critical. And here I agree with Stephen and Penny. It's not just about delivering aid. It's about protection. It's an understanding what the people are going through. It's about engaging non-state armed group and government at the same time, very painfully, yeah. on a daily basis, if we want to progress a little bit. People will measure us against that, yeah. not against what we do or not from London. OK, and there, I'm going to open it up, but I just wanted to put that actually to, to you, Mark, because that is the reality on the ground. You are dealing with al-Shabaab. You are dealing with Nusra. You are dealing with some pretty unpleasant characters. Have you got the stomach for that? Um, well, I think the, the sort of 
the distinction the report draws between humanitarian and development is actually the wrong distinction. Mm. Yeah. The real issue is much broader than that. It's about security and conflict and politics and mm. um, and you know the world is dealing not just with humanitarian problems, it's dealing with a bunch of other problems. And yeah. if you're in a government like I am, you've got a whole array of stuff yes. that you're kind of managing, including uh, dealing with the threat of terrorism and the counter-terrorism legislation we have in this country and other countries yeah. have, which gives us responsibilities to be really careful about who we're giving money, money to sure. and how it's channeled. Yeah. So I think we need across the... Um, and I, you know, I say this to my colleagues in my own organization where the humanitarians and that's me 30 years ago that's where I started still have a slightly holier than thou perspective on life and it's hard enough to get them to talk to sometimes to the development folk what we really need them to engage with is well who is it who's going to reach uh, I was in Kismayo not long ago who is it recently liberated from al-Shabaab who is it that's going to reach down to that front line and to be able to provide services to people whose lives is a little bit better because Al-Shabaab has been pushed back a bit, because that's where the need is most acute, and that's where you make the most progress on the, the conflict resolution and the, yeah. you know, getting into this longer-term <coughs> game. OK, now, we're going to open it up for questions. And I saw a very good cartoon yesterday, which was, it was about an event like this, and it said, right, we've just got just long enough for somebody to give an incredibly long, tedious, self-indulgent, <laughs> unintelligible rant, and then we'll have to wrap up. So if you are that person, put your hand down now, right? Uh, what we want, um, brief questions, say who you are and who you work for, gentlemen in the front row.